Predicting Pretty, a group of Penn State students get the world's attention by making a one-of-a-kind forecast. We touched on a lot of photographers, meteorologists, television meteorologists, filmmakers. We really opened up our own eyes to just how much of an audience there is for this. The science inside the biggest recycling plant in the country's biggest city. We introduce everything that's left now on the belt to ballistic separators. The ultimate game of memory puts medical students to the test. I feel like this whole BEST program has really helped me with being more confident in my memorization skills. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching SciTech Now. Sunsets are social media gold. Hashtag Sunset has more than 118 million entries on Instagram. But getting the perfect picture means being in the right place at the right time. That's about to get a whole lot easier. Producer Bill Hallman has the story. Sunset is no mystery. We know, to the minute, what time it happens every day. But you never really know for sure if the evening will simply fade to black or flare up for a glorious finale. Until now. A group of former and current Penn State students are using the same data meteorologists use to predict the weather, to predict fiery skies, and it all got started with a box of pizza. We knew Steve uh, was one of the best computer programmers we knew here at Penn State University, and he was a meteorologist and a meteorology student. So Jake and Ben actually messaged me. Uh, I was a sophomore at the time, and uh, they promised me free food. And uh, of course, I said yes. That meeting between Jacob DeFlitch, Steve Hallett, and Ben Reppert was the beginning of SunsetWX.com. The website publishes four maps a day predicting the best places on the planet to view vivid sunsets and sunrises. But before they could forecast beauty, they needed to define it. So the biggest concern right off the bat was the fact that if you asked 10 people what their version of a great sunset is, you'd probably get 10 different answers. So then we started thinking to ourselves, okay, what constitutes a good sunset? The group opted for vivid colors over clear skies. And that was the foundation for their formula. It takes into consideration moisture at more than a dozen different layers of the atmosphere, pressure patterns, and clouds, an ingredient the group considers the canvas for the perfect sunset. It's kind of, if you think of like a, a big projector screen at a drive-in movie, the radiation, the visible light from the sun, illuminates the underside of a deck of high clouds and then projects light onto it. A custom algorithm crunches the data and scores the best locations with the brightest colors. It didn't take long for the concept to catch on. So on the 22nd of November, four days after our launch, our model was predicting this incredible strip of color along I-95, the big hubs, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, Boston. And we thought, okay, tonight's gonna be like a crazy night for interacting. They were right. This is the map they put out, and this was the sky. And I was, okay, well, this is just about to go next level, and then, you know, CBS contacted us. How do you predict the perfect sunset? We decided to go along the scale of vividness. How bright? Yes, how bright, how, uh, I guess you could say the wow factor. Since that forecast in 2015, SunsetWX.com has been featured on CBS Saturday Morning, Good Morning America, and on websites like Slate and 538.com. So I wanted to find out for myself, does it work? All right, so I'm standing outside of my office at Innovation Park. The SunsetWeather.com map was a bright orange when I left. Take a look at the sky. It's beautiful, full of uh, bright pinks, oranges. This video probably won't do it justice but it is awesome. I would say that this is a verified forecast for tonight. We touched on a lot of photographers, meteorologists, television meteorologists, filmmakers. We really opened up our own eyes to just how much of an audience there is for this. The team has recently brought on a fourth member to help them create an app and an interface that'll allow outside developers to use their data. But as they focus more energy on the business, they're trying not to forget the most important part of any sunset, 
seeing it. We get so caught up in our daily lives with using electronics and we're stuck in the office behind a cubicle on a daily basis that we seldomly go out and just take a breather and enjoy, you know, what we have around us. My goal is for it to be used um, by anyone who loves the sunset and sunrise. The bottom line is provide a tangible uh, relation between the weather. Stopping and really yeah, taking time to pause within uh, your busy day and just admiring what nature has to give you. With more than 500 million downloads worldwide, Pokemon Go was a global introduction to augmented reality. Hari Srinivasan teamed up with an augmented reality expert to try the game and to talk about how the technology will evolve. Right now, we're in Central Park, and we're going to sort of discover the world of Pokemon. I'm a total novice. Mark Squark, uh, you work at the Augmented Reality Lab at NYU. I do. They have a whole lab just to study augmented reality, and even in the mobile space. So he's been thinking about this for a long time. Mark, why did Pokemon stick? Um, so first would be the branding. Pokemon brand, um, the millennials coming in, they have a little bit of extra cash, uh, and uh, smartphone devices are capable of doing it. Yeah. Um, so that would be probably the biggest reason. Second reason that um, would be really great would be the gameplay that uh, Niantic's developed, that they actually have the, a, a fun game to play. Here's this little blue thing, so I'm supposed to just, what? Yep. Toss it over? Flick the ball. I missed. That's not good. A little to the left. How about that? Direct hit. Success. What do these things mean? The Pokemon caught 100 XP, a Pokemon, new Pokemon 500 XP total. What does that mean? What are the points? Points at the top would be to level this creature up so I can make him more powerful. The second set was at your actual user level. So right now you're starting off at a level one. Yeah. Um, like uh, I'm at a level 19 right now. So you've just <laughs> begun the game. We're actually right next to a Pokestop. Right um, there, somewhere over here. So I you guess. have, basically you're looking at a Google map and he's, yeah. Harry sees himself on the Google map. Um, this is his avatar, and this would be an example of a mixed reality. I can see a representation of myself um, overlaying uh, basically a real-world location. So this is this map is actually quite accurate. Now you're going to flick it from side to side, and you're going to oh, see Oh, look, that. Going. Now I can see. In about five minutes, you can come back to it and um, collect more resources. Uh, just a reminder, if you're just joining us, it's about 11.40 Eastern Time. Uh, I'm Hari Srinivas, and this is Mark Squarek. We are going on my first ever Pokey Walk in Central Park, and we're doing this live on Facebook, so we're also taking your questions. Uh, I was just handed a phone with a couple of these. If you were a Pokemon creature, what would you be? <laughs> I have no idea what that would mean. Buforion. <laughs> what? A Buforion? Oh, that's the name? That's a word? Pound for pound, they're pretty, they're pretty strong, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. What happened with the crazy crowds hunting Pokemon in Central Park a few weeks ago? Um, there's still some crowds around here, so if people are actually interested in that, you come out on like a Saturday or Saturday night, um, and you can find larger groups of people. The, the, what they're talking about, if, you, if anybody in the, the audience wants to Google Central Park Pokemon, yeah. do a Google image search, you about, about 500 people are running, literally about 500 people start running in that direction. People are getting out of their cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, saw that. That was yeah. crazy. And it's, I, that was a moment in history. Um, <laughs> it's really, because they're chasing after something that technically isn't, the, some people might not see it as being there. It is located there by GP, so information located at a very specific location. Can you actually catch them all? In other words, can you find every type of Pokemon here in New York City? Technically speaking, you can if you were sort of cheating. Um, they <laughs> do, they locate different Pokemon at, um, at different geographic locations. There are certain Pokemon you can only get in the U.S. There are certain Pokemon you can only get at um, di other different countries. Um, what people can do is you can sort of fake your GPS location and it would think that I'm actually in Japan and then the, the Pokemon could appear. But somebody has caught them all. More than one person has already caught all the Pokemon. Hey, 
Okay, what, uh, my name's Hari. John, nice to meet you. This is Mark Squarek. Hey, nice Mark. to meet you. So Pleasure. you are playing Central Park Pokemon right I now? I am playing Central Park Pokemon right Why? now, yes. I'm from North Carolina, so I'm here on vacation. I heard Central Park's kind of a hot spot for Pokemon, and it's just a I don't know, beautiful day to walk around. So. Okay, good. So what level are you on this thing? I am level 25. Mark is impressed. <laughs> How many hours a day or week are you playing this game? My roommates and I will go out downtown like um, after work and maybe play for like an hour and a half or so. What I'm more concerned about is the people that just do this by themselves, and I'm like, are they Let's going into this augmented world more so than being immersed in this real one? Sure, I think that's a super valid concern. Um, my experience playing it hadn't been like that so much, but it's you know I've interacted with other people playing when I yeah. go out. It's been more of a social thing than you know just me by myself on my phone thing. Good. Thank you very much for spending some yeah, of your day sure with thing. us. All right. Great meeting you. Yes. Hey, uh, we've got another young man. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm Hari. What's your name? Matthew. Matthew, where are you from? I'm from Dallas, Texas. Have you heard about these Pokemon uh, things that are inside Central Park? Yes, sir. My God, I feel so old when you call me sir. So, were you collecting any of these things? Uh, no, I wasn't playing the game right now. We were just looking for the softball fields, but I was thinking about it considering that there's so many Pokestops around. I'm totally the old guy here, but is this cool for people your age to be playing this right now? Oh yeah, totally. What's so interesting about it for you? Well, it's just that Pokemon, when it first came out, it was very exciting and it, it just kind of died down. And now that they're able to bring it back in a new fashion and with new technology so you don't have to keep up with the cards and stuff like that and I still have cards and I still have the total playing deck and you do okay yeah. thank you have a great time at the softball you fields too. thank you who knew all right so I'm gonna tap this this is a poke stop I'm gonna spin this wheel of fortune and one, two, three. I've just racked up three more of these little red Pokeballs. All right, I gotta find one of these. Let's f let's find a, a creature. Let's find a creature, whatever that means. And let's. Uh, is it really really far? Right in front of us. Um, they've got one. Where? I've got one right here. You want to try to? You got, got one. More. Oh oh oh! What is that? John, wow. Okay. Well, there's a whole bunch of them around here. All right. So we were standing next to a little whatever that was, Paris. Are you guys seeing what we were seeing? Was there a Pokemon right there? There was? Yeah. And you caught it? Hi, what's your name? Carlton. Carlton? Nice. Dalton. Dalton, nice to meet you guys. So are you playing Pokemon right now? Yes. <laughs> Is that how he usually sounds when he's playing this game? Yes. Yeah. Are you ever concerned about Dalton kind of walking off maybe farther than what you'd be comfortable with in your neighborhood chasing these things? Actually, we do this as a family. My do you son, like it? It's fun. It's what actually, do you like about it? I like the fact that families can do it together. They're out now instead yeah. of sitting at home playing video games or parents on their phones on Facebook. Uh -huh. Now it's a family event where you can all play with your children, walk around, get exercise, as well as interact with your kids. Hey, what about the data? Yeah. I'm fine with his parents knowing where Dalton's going, yeah. but technically that information sits on a server somewhere yep. um, that's owned by a company that can sell it to a third party, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. The way that I would play Pokemon Go would be if you're not going to go there in real life or you wouldn't be comfortable with like your friends or other people in real life knowing that you're going to this place, yeah. you probably shouldn't do it with Pokemon Go. Real world, how you would approach the real world to your gameplay. So and it seems that what these guys are doing is a pretty smart move. Play with your kid. I think this is one of the best ways to kind of do it. This is really great. Well, thank you and enjoy the rest of your yeah, afternoon. Yeah. Thank you very thank you much. Good to meet you guys. Yes. Thank you. And take care. Have fun. Good luck hunting. This is just the first game that's kind of made a splash. Yeah. You're expecting bigger things. Absolutely. One of the best things about Pokemon Go, and it was sort of, we were kind of touching on it, um, in my grad class, one of the assignments was we had to augment the bus between Pratt University and NYU. And um, the assignment, one of the assignments was to try to bring people together. Like to get someone on the bus who I've never met before, strike up a conversation, or just get people kind of communicating. It really could foster this um, kind of this community. It's taking people out of the houses. We're hearing it on a number of these different comments, like it's getting them to come out of the houses. Um, and if it could actually start bringing people together, I think this could be really amazing. Uh, Mark Squarek from NYU, thank you very much for your time today. My name is Hari Srinivasan. I work for PBS on SciTech Now and NewsHour and NewsHour Weekend. Thanks so much for watching. New York City produces around 800 tons of recyclable materials every day. Sorting it is a dirty and technical task. Science Friday takes us behind the scenes at New York City's largest recycling plant. You know, I think people think of recycling and it's that it's people bundling their newspaper and Boy Scouts moving things and people are 
kind of fascinated and I guess they're surprised at sort of the large industrial and highly mechanized nature of the process. Uh, my name is Thomas Outerbridge and I'm the general manager for Sims Municipal Recycling. Well, so we're in the business of receiving, processing, and marketing mixed recyclables that are collected by municipalities from their residents. We service the five boroughs of the city. It includes all rigid plastics, so everything from a you know, laundry hamper to a toy to a plastic bottle, uh, all glass and all metal products from tin cans to bed frames. You know, we have to basically take this mix and, and sort it to a fairly extensive degree to turn it into a commodity. If you didn't know what you were looking at, you'd think it's just garbage. The, the materials accumulate on the tipping floor, right? It's dumped there by sanitation or we unload our barges there. We then have a front end loader, a big front end loader that feeds a conveyor and that will transport the material to the liberator. The liberator is a slow speed shredder. Call it the liberator because the idea is really not to cut things up, but to really open bags and disentangle stuff. People who live in high-rise buildings accumulate these bags in the basement. And some people think plastic bags, just because they're plastic, they should be recycled, so they stuff bags full of bags and then stick those in the bags. And So the liberator rips everything apart so that when we introduce it to the sorting equipment, the sorting equipment can do its job. Disc screen are these discs and they spin and they throw the material forwards and there's gaps between those discs. So anything that's less than two and a half inches goes through the disc screen and that is really targeting glass. So it's, it's, it's removing 95% of our glass. We send that to our glass plant in Jersey where then it goes through a whole nother set of sorting steps and then crush the remaining colored glass into an aggregate. After removing the glass, the material passes underneath large drum magnets, which are big drums that turn and pick up all the ferrous metals. Those ferrous metals then go to another trommel screen where we separate the smaller ferrous metals like tin cans from the bigger metal furniture and things we get. Then after we've removed the glass and the ferrous metal, we introduce everything that's left now on the belt to ballistic separators. Two-dimensional material will lie flat on these paddles, walk up a incline, whereas three-dimensional material will bounce back. So now our three-dimensional material uh, goes into a whole sequence of optical sorters. Different materials have a different spectrum in near-infrared light, so we can distinguish plastics by resin type. So it is looking for anything on that conveyor belt that is PET plastic. It's telling the air jets, here comes a PET water bottle. We use air effectively to blow it off of the conveyor belt and separate it from the balance of the material. Whatever is not ejected as PET then travels onto the next optical sorter. They go very, very fast. They go much faster than a human being could possibly pick. They're looking at um, seven tons of material an hour. Each step along the way, you're going after one more item until you left with Ideally nothing, but of course odds and ends that shouldn't be in there that end up as residue at the end of the process. Most products are put into balers that make bales, that similar to people might think of hay bales. I mean basically we compress the material for shipping. And then um, as sorted commodities we then ship out of here to customers. People are absolutely buying this stuff. Um, it does go up and down with the market. Yeah, we can do probably 800 tons a day. The uh, participation rate, I think, has gone up pretty significantly. So we're seeing more and more material. We still know there's a huge amount still going to landfill. Probably maybe 40% now of the recyclables that are meant to go in the recycling bin are still going into the trash. So please recycle. There are more than 200 bones in the human body. Medical students need to memorize them all. But a clever program is helping students maximize their mind power by turning complicated concepts into a game. This is Dr. Dexter Frederick, the CEO of the Brain Expansion and Scholastic Program, or BEST, a medical-based educational program in the Tampa Bay area. The mission of our program really is to help our students uh, gain access, gain information, be nurtured in their pursuit of becoming health professionals. 
Today, Dr. Frederick is teaching his students memory techniques to help them in their studies and for an upcoming memory tournament. I thought it would be very important to uh, include a session where students can, can be open and understand how their brain works so that they can learn faster, more efficiently, and, and learning at a pace where it's, it's just tremendous, where the con confidence level is at a high level. Door. 16. Coffee. 17. Table. 18. Child. 19. Phone. It's important for them to use as many as the, their faculty, mental faculties, yes. to keep I them engaged. It. So whether or not we use the music, whether or not you use acting, whether or not you use um, the movement of the hands, that is, you know, amazingly an important uh, tool in where learning can occur. So when I ask a student to come forward, that immediately keeps the adrenaline, pushes the adrenaline a little higher, and all of a sudden the nerve fibers are exciting, and learning can occur faster. Oh, eyes. Then? Apple. Very good. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> After all the training, the students are ready for tournament day. They gather to compete at Hillsborough Community College in Tampa. The memory tournament is an environment where students can show in their long-term memory and how, how quickly they can remember. The tournament begins with much anticipation and excitement. And we have divided it into three main categories where they have to remember words. They'll also be given a list of numbers and they will also be given some medical trivia. So you'll have two students next, facing each other or next to each other and there'll be a judge. They will be shown uh, a list of words and uh, they will have about two minutes to look at those words and um, using the memory techniques that they have been trained with uh, to use, they will then try to retain that information. Player number one will say what the first word is. Player number two will then say what the second word is. Player number one will say what the third word is, alternating back and forth until one actually uh, misses one of the, the words. Then we do that with numbers. So they'll have a list of 20 numbers or 30 numbers. The final contest is medical trivia. Here the students work in teams. Next question. Many lives were changed today. The winner of the word competition was Desu Imudia. Honestly, I feel like this whole BEST program has really helped me with being more confident in my memorization skills and understanding that I do have a great memory and so does everybody else. It's just the different ways in which we use it and how we figure out how we best can be able to memorize. And this competition has definitely brought a lot to the table and has shown me that I am capable of a lot more things than I had thought. And Tylan Thomas used her training to win the numbers competition. It was easy to make a story out of them, and some of the numbers had patterns too. Some of them would be 43, 44, then 33, or I would have to make up on 38th Street, then it would go to 19th Street like I'm driving. So making a story out of what I've had, I felt accomplished at the end. I was very surprised at myself that my brain function to go this long with the numbers. Luke Detlor led the winning team in the Brain Bowl. He found the best program of great significance. Not only does it teach you facts about anatomy and how to be ethical in the medical field, but it also gives you skills for memory and note taking and these skills can be applied to anything that you set your mind to. We also had something that really stood out to me and that was that we affirmed ourselves every time that we began a memory exercise. I have a great memory. I have a powerful memory. Very good. Go best Tampa, right? And I think that that taught us confidence, and that confidence, I think, is the key to having a great memory and to be able to expand it as far as we can. This is something anyone can do, no matter what their background. If we can allow students in the world, in, in the United States, in Florida, to, to be, number one, excited about learning um, and, 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 don't, and feel very confident in whatever their, their field of study is, um, that's exciting. The benefits of expanding your memory skills are vast. Did you make a story? Yeah, I made a story. Okay, tell me about your story about the gift. My life philosophy is to use my influence to make the world a better place. And if I could do that and, and help some students and help maybe one day a doctor or a nurse uh, that I trained that will take care of me and 
save my life. Uh, that would be just a, a, a joy. And, and to raise a new generation of healthcare providers that are compassionate, kind, loving, and have a great memory. On the next SciTech Now, the very best of CES, will take you inside the biggest tech show on the planet. You can watch full episodes of SciTech Now on demand and on WPSU's YouTube channel. I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.